Roberto Torres Cedillo was born with a severe blood condition. Unable to risk even the slightest cut, he spent his childhood indoors. In spite of all the health challenges he faced, Roberto drew closer to God and found his purpose, bringing hope to the lost and the hurting. Today, he serves those in need with Operation Blessing and brings the gospel to the nations as host of CBN's Next Gen Voices and as online host and producer of the Spanish 700 Club. Well, Roberto, it's great to have you on the show today. Thank yeah, you so much. It's an honor to have you. Thank you. Uh, you had a very difficult childhood, and most parents have to create a safe environment for their children, but your parents had to go and, and literally yeah. You could not be cut. Yeah. Uh, what, 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 what's the condition? How did your parents find it? Yeah. Yeah, it's called hemophilia. Um, I was born with severe hemophilia type A. And basically what it is is uh, one of the proteins that's responsible for clotting um, the blood. So when there's a cut, when there's an injury, this protein naturally kicks in in the, in the blood and helps clot. So my condition was a severe disorder where there was 0% of this factor, it's called factor eight. And so people have this factor in, uh, you know, a good quantity, 50, 60% or, or whatever, but my condition was 0%. And so when I was about six months old, my parents started finding bruises all over my body. And that's when they, they, had, they got the hint that something was wrong. They had to go get the lab tests. And uh, when they got the lab test, they realized that I was born with this and it just rocked their world. You know, it was an incredibly difficult time. Um, because my mom knew what this meant. Her brother had had this disease, and um, he's now with the Lord, but he had a really difficult childhood. And so the fear of what this, what this meant really started paralyzing them, and then the journey of faith started for them with this. Well, when, when did you first become aware you had a problem? I think um, very early on, maybe um, two, three years old, um, part of it is you feel, you, you see the effects of it, so you're, you know, a little bump in the knee, a scrape, um, you fall and you break, you know, something here in your lip and just blood, you know, continues to gush out and you can't stop it. Um, ankles swell up really bad. And so by age five, I had developed really a type of arthritis where it was so swollen that it was the joint line, the joint lining, which is like the synovium gets so inflamed that you need surgery. And I was basically in a wheelchair. Uh, it was a stroller. They didn't want to use a wheelchair, but uh, it was basically that level where if I didn't have surgery, I wouldn't be able to walk again. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You say that this led your parents to faith. How, how did that happen? Because a lot of parents facing that would say, well, there must not be a God. What, or if there is a God, what, why, did, why does my son have this? Yes, definitely. That was a question. My, my parents uh, loved Jesus. They were uh, first-generation believers. They were pastors as well. And my mom was very young, young and young in the faith. She was 20 years old when she had me. So at 21, 22, she's wrestling with all these things. She had to grow up really fast. And one of the things that obviously came to their minds was why? Everybody asked that question. And my parents were led to John 9, verse 3, where it says uh, Jesus and his disciples are looking uh, at a blind man who was born blind from birth. And, and they say, Lord, who sinned, this man or his parents? And Jesus said, neither him nor his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. And they really took hold of that. And that was sort of the, what changed the trajectory of, okay, this, we don't understand the why, but we're gonna hold on to who, who is God in this situation? And that's what kept them going. And there's so many stories where, um, if I hadn't had an intervention, a supernatural intervention of healing, I would not be here. There were times where I had to get surgery at two years old and I would have died bleeding out in the, in the operating room if God hadn't intervened. Uh, so many miracles of progressive ongoing healing where it was a diet of eyes, tears, and prayers at night. And that was what my parents were accustomed to, just leaning on the Lord. It, it, it was either lean on Jesus or you got nowhere to go. You know, it was a matter of life and death for them. So what happened to you? You're not in a wheelchair. Yeah. You're not all bruised. <laughs> <laughs> I know. What, what happened? Yeah. So God has been extremely faithful. Uh, it's a long story short. I was able to get surgery by age five, my ankle. Uh, I was able to get surgery for it and it restored it. It gave me a good percent of mobility. But throughout the years, God provided. See, it was, people ask me, so are you completely healed? And I say, well, medically speaking, 
If you look at the records when I get my blood drawn, I still have this. But we really made a decision early on, and this is something my parents really kind of, um, you know, tra trailblazed for me, that the cross happened, and Jesus carried not just my sins, but this disease. And it says in Peter that by his wounds, we are healed. We have been healed. And so that reality of like, this has happened. I am healed. I don't carry this as a curse. It's dealt with really changed our lives and every single stage of provision of supernatural healing uh, of coming to the States. Really, that was one thing that led us here because when my dad came to the States to work uh, at a church that received us, they welcomed us in the Cromwell family. If it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be here. And then I started getting insurance. I got medicine for the first time. So at age 11, I started being able to experience life like never before because the previous years I was mainly indoors. And all I could do was uh, just read. I spent a lot of time going to conferences, spending time uh, reading the word. And I was with my parents most of the time. So I grew up a very uh, uh, guarded, shielded kid, but also just being immersed in the word and going wherever my parents went. And so later on, when I got medicine, I still had a lot of issues, a lot of complications, but I've seen the Lord's faithfulness all the way up here. I was able to learn English. Then I came to Regent University. And so all that has let me to be here with you and talk and just tell about God's faithfulness through the process. What, what, what called you to ministry? Was there a point where you felt called? Yeah. From an early age, uh, from my earliest memories, I remember because I couldn't be like the other kids, my mom got this brilliant thing from the Lord. It was the Lord that gave her this. She used to tell me, you're my little Samuel. Mm -hmm. And she said, you're not like, um, you're not like the other kids. But like Samuel, he was in the temple and he paid a price, but he was in the presence of God. And she got this verse from Acts 22, where Paul says that when Ananias came to him, he said, the God of our fathers has chosen you to see the righteous one, to hear the words of his mouth, for you will be a witness to all people of what you have seen and heard. And she took that from me. So as a early, you know, early years, really, you know, young kid, I grew up with this sense of destiny, this sense of my life is going to be used to lead people to Jesus, to experience the compassion of Jesus, even when it doesn't make sense, even when there are questions, when they're hurting uh, in the wise, discovering that. So I grew up with that. And ever since, you know, I really just wanted to share that, to share about the faithfulness of the Lord through the valley, through the suffering and through the questions. Yeah. Yeah. And you're doing that. You're doing that now in two languages. Yeah. Um, tell us about 700 Club Oi. Yeah, so that's the, the Spanish 100 Club, and I have the privilege to speak to the Latin American audience, and I never would have imagined that that calling to witness, to preach, was going to come here to CBN and, and, be, and to see the legacy. You know, sometimes I get comments on Facebook that say, in 1988, I received the Lord watching the dub version with Dr. Robertson, and now I'm watching your sermon. And to me, I, was, I wasn't born in 1988. And it's such a humbling thing. It's such an incredible thing of the legacy that I get to um, draw from the well that I didn't dig, go through doors that I didn't open, and to stand upon the shoulders of giants and see what God can do. It's, it's beautiful. God digs the well. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. But he God, uses us, right, too. <laughs> he, uses, he uses through the generations. Exactly. And yeah. so, yeah. yeah. You've got an English language program, too. Yeah. Tell us about that one. Yeah, Next Gen, uh, Next Gen Voices. Um, it's a program where we showcase uh, young, dynamic pastors from across the country, and they preach. They share the good news in a relevant way to a younger audience. And then at the end of the show, uh, we have a call for prayer, for ministry, for people that want to call our CBN Prayer Center. And I, sometimes I do a ministry segment at the end to kind of recap the sermon. So it's also great that, again, I would never have imagined that I was going to be also a witness in my second language. Yeah, and <laughs> fulfilling your mother's prayers. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Well, if you'd like to watch Roberto on Next Gen Voice, it, it airs every Saturday and Sunday morning at 11 a.m. on the CBN News Channel, which you can get at uh, cbn.com slash nextgenvoices or on the CBN News app. And if you're one of our Spanish-speaking viewers, I want to invite you to follow 700 Club Oi on Facebook, and you can watch it there. Roberto, thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank, thank you so for much. responding to the call. Thank you. Yeah.